The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth by George Alfred Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 5. A Solution of the Conspiracy. Part 1. The annexed letter which has been cavilled at, as much as copied, is a rationale of the conspiracy combined from the government's own officers. When it was written it was believed to be true. The evidence at the trial has confirmed much of it. I reprint it to show how men's ingenuities were at work to account for the conception and progress of the plot. Washington, May 2nd. Justice and fame are equally and simultaneously satisfied. The President is not yet in his sarcophagus, but all the conspirators against his life, with a minor exception or two, are in their prison cells waiting for the halter. The dark and bloody plot against a good ruler's life is now so fully unraveled that I may make it plain to you. There is nothing to be gained by further waiting. The trials are proceeding. The evidence is mountain high. Within a week the national scaffold will have done its work and be laid away forever. This prompt and necessary justice will signal the last public assassination in America. Borgia and Medici and Brinvilliers have left no descendants on this side of the world. The conspiracy with both the greatest and the smallest of our cycle. Narrowed in execution to a few, it was understood and connived at by a multitude. One man was its head and heart. Its accessories were so numerous that the trouble is not whom to suspect, but whom not accuse. Damning as the result may be to the character of our race, it must be admitted in the light of facts that Americans are as secretive and as skillful plotters as any people in the world the Rye House plot, never fully understood, the many schemes of Mazzini, never fastened upon him sufficiently well for implication, yield in extent, darkness, and intricacy to the Republican plot against the President's life and those of his counselors. The police operations prove that the late murder was not a spasmodic and fitful crime, but long premeditated, and carried to consummation with as much cohesion and resolution as the murder of Alessandro de' Medici or Henri Quatre. I have been accused of canonizing Booth, much as I denounce and deprecate his crime, holding him to be worthy of all execration, and so seeped in blood that the excuses of a century will fail to lift him out of the atmosphere of common felons. I still, at every new development, stand farther back in surprise and terror at the wonderful resources and extraordinary influence of one whom I had learned to consider a mere thespian, full of sound, fury, and assertion. Strange and anomalous as the facts may seem, John Wilkes Booth was the sole projector of the plot against the President which culminated in the taking of that good man's life. He had rolled under his tongue the sweet paragraphs of Shakespeare referring to Brutus, as had his father so well, that the old man named one son Junius Brutus and the other John Wilkes, after the wild English agitator, until it became his ambition, like the wicked Lorenzino de' Medici, to stake his life upon one stroke for fame, the murder of a ruler obnoxious to the South. That Wilkes Booth was a southern man from the first may be accounted for upon grounds of interest as well as of sympathy. It is insidious to find no higher incentive than appreciation, but on the stage this is the first and last motive, and as Edwin Booth made his success in the North and remained steadfast, Wilkes Booth was most truly applauded in the South, and became a rebel. A false emotion of gratitude, as well as an impulse of mingled waywardness and gratitude, set John Wilkes' face from the first toward the North, and he burned to make his name a part of history, cried into fame by the applauses of the South. He hung to this bloody suggestion with dogged inflexibility, maintaining only one axiom above all the rest, that whatever minor parts might be enacted, Casca, Cassius, or what not, he was to be the dramatic Brutus, accepting the assassin's negativeness. In other words, the idea was to be his own, as well as the crowning blow. Booth shrank at first from murder, until another and less dangerous resolution failed. This was no less than the capture of the President's body and its detention or transportation to the South. I do not rely on this assertion upon his sealed letter, where he avows it. 
there has been found upon a street within the city limits a house belonging to one mrs green mined and furnished with underground apartments manacles and all the accessories to private imprisonment here the president and as many as could be gagged and conveyed away with him were to be concealed in the event of failure to run them into the confederacy owing to his failure to group around him as many men as he desired booth abandoned the project of kidnapping but the house was discovered last week as represented ready to be blown up at a moment's notice it was at this time that booth devised his triumphant route through the south the dramatic element seems to have been never lacking in his design and with all his base purposes he never failed to consider some subsequent notoriety to be enjoyed he therefore shipped before the end of eighteen sixty four his theatrical wardrobe from canada to nassau after the commission of his crime he intended to reclaim it and star throughout the south drawing money as much by his crime as his abilities when booth began on his own responsibility to hunt for accomplices he found his theory at fault the bold men he had dreamed of refused to join him in the rash attempt at kidnapping the president and were too conscientious to meditate murder all those who presented themselves were military men unwilling to be subordinate to a civilian and a mere play-actor and the mortified bravo found himself therefore compelled to sink to a petty rank in the plot or to make use of base and despicable assistance his vanity found it easier to compound with the second alternative than the first here began the first resolve which in its mere animal estate we may name courage booth found that a tragedy in real life could no more be enacted without greasy faced and not need supernumeraries than upon the mimic stage your first citizen who swings a stave for mark antony and drinks hard porter behind the flies is very likely the bravo of real life who murders between his cocktails at the nearest bar wilkes booth had passed the ordeal of a garlicky green room and did not shrink from the broader and ranker green room of real life he assembled around him one by one the cutthroats at whom his soul would have revolted except that he had become by resolve a cutthroat in himself about this time certain gentlemen in canada began to be unenviably known i abstain from giving their names because unaware of how far they seconded this crime if at all but they seconded as infamous things such as cowardly raids from neutral territory into the states bank robbings lake pirating city burning counterfeiting railway sundering and the importation of yellow fever into peaceful and unoffending communities i make no charges against those whom i do not know but simply say that the confederate agents jacob thompson larry mcdonald clement clay and some others had already accomplished enough villainy to make wilkes booth on the first of the present year believe that he had but to seek an interview with them he visited the provinces once certainly and three times it is believed stopping in montreal at st lawrence hall and banking four hundred and fifty five dollars odd at the ontario bank this was his own money i have myself seen his bank book with a single entry of this amount it was found in the room of atzerott at kirkwood's hotel from this visit whatever encouragement booth received he continued in systematic correspondence with one or more of those agents down to the commission of his crime i dare not say how far each of these agents was implicated my personal conviction is that they were neither loth to the murder nor astonished when it had been done they had money with discretion from the confederacy though acting at discretion and outside of responsibility and always at every wild adventure they instructed their dupes that each man took his life in his hand on every incursion into the north so beale took his raiding on the great lakes so kennedy took his on a midnight bonfire tramp into the metropolis so took the st albans raiders their lives in their palms dashing into a peaceful town and if these agents entertained wilkes booth's suggestion at all they plainly told him that he carried his life in his dagger's edge and would expect from them neither aid nor exculpation some one or all of these agents furnished booth with a murderer the fellow wood or pain who stabbed mr seward and was caught at mrs surratt's house in washington he was one of three kentucky brothers all outlaws 
and had himself, it is believed, accompanied one of his brothers, who is known to have been at St. Albans on the day of the bank delivery. This Payne, besides being positively identified as the assassin of the Sewards, had no friends nor haunts in Washington. He was simply a dispatched murderer, and after the night of the crime struck northward of the frontier, instead of southward in the company of Booth. The proof of this will follow in the course of the article. While I assert that the Canadian agents knew Booth and patted his back, calling him, like Macbeth, the Prince of Cutthroats, I am equally certain that Booth's project was unknown in Richmond. No word, nor written line, no clue of any sort has been found attaching Booth to the Confederate authorities. The most that can be urged to meet preposterous claims of this sort is that out of the rebellion grew the murder, which is like attributing the measles to the creation of man. But MacDonald and his party had money at discretion, and under their control the vilest fellows on the continent. Their personal influence over those errant ones amounted to omnipotence. Most of the latter were young and sanguine people, like Beale and Booth. Their plots were made up at St. Catharines, Toronto, and Montreal, and they have maintained since the war began rebel mail routes between Canada and Richmond, leading directly past Washington. If Booth received no positive instructions, he was at any rate adjudged a man likely to be of use, and therefore introduced to the rebel agencies in and around Washington. Doubtless by direct letter, or verbal instruction, he received a password to the house of Mrs. Surratt. Half applauded, half rebuffed by the rebel agents in Canada, Booth's impression of his visit were just those which would whet him soonest for the tragedy. His vanity had been fed by the assurance that success depended upon himself alone, and that as he had the responsibility he would absorb the fame, and the method of correspondence was of that dark and mysterious shape which powerfully operated upon his dramatic temperament. What could please an actor, and the son of an actor, better than to mingle as a principal in a real conspiracy, the aims of which were pseudo-patriotic, and the end so astounding that at its coming the whole globe would reel? Booth reasoned that the ancient world would not feel more sensitively the death of Julius Caesar than the new and sudden taking off of Abraham Lincoln. And so he grew into the idea of murder. It became his business thought. It was his recreation and his study. He had not worked half so hard for histrionic success as for his terrible graduation into an assassin. He had fought often on the boards and seen men die in well-imitated horror, with flowing blood upon his keen sword's edge, and the strong stride of mimic victory with which he flourished his weapon at the closing of the curtain. He embraced conspiracy like an old diplomatist, and found in the woman and the spot subjects for emulation. Southeast of Washington stretches a tapering peninsula, composed of four fertile counties, which at the remote tip make Point Lookout, and do not contain any town within them of more than a few hundred inhabitants. Tobacco has ruined the land of these, and slavery has ruined the people. Yet in the beginning they were of that splendid stock of Calvert and Lord Baltimore, but retain today only the religion of the peaceful founder. I mention it as an exceptional and remarkable fact that every conspirator in custody is by education a Catholic. These are our most loyal citizens elsewhere, but on the western shore of Maryland it is a noxious and pestilential place for patriotism. The county immediately outside of the District of Columbia to the south is named Prince George's, and the pleasantest village of this county, close to Washington, is called Surrattsville. This consists of a few cabins at a crossroads surrounding a fine old hotel, the master whereof, giving the settlement his name, left the property to his wife, who for a long time carried it on with indifferent success. Having a son and several daughters, she moved to Washington, soon after the beginning of the war, and let the tavern to a trusty friend, one John Lloyd. Surrattsville has gained nothing in patronage or business from the war, except that it became at an early date a rebel post office. The great secret mail from Matthias Creek, Virginia, to Port Tobacco, struck Surrattsville, and then headed off to the east to Washington, going meanderingly north. Of this post route, Mrs. Surratt was a manageress, 
and john lloyd when he rented her hotel assumed the responsibility of looking out for the mail as well the duty of making mrs surratt at home when she chose to visit him so surrattsville only ten miles from washington has been throughout the war a sect of conspiracy it was like a suburb of richmond reaching quite up to the rival capital and though the few unionists on the peninsula knew its reputation well enough nothing of the sort came out until the murder treason never found a better agent than mrs surratt she is a large masculine self-possessed female mistress of her house and as lithe a rebel as bell boyd or mrs greenhow she has not the flippantry and menace of the first nor the social power of the second but the rebellion has found no fitter agent at her country tavern and washington home booth was made welcome and there began the muttered murder against the nation and mankind the acquaintance of mrs surratt in lower maryland undoubtedly suggested to booth the route of escape and made him known to his subsequent accomplices last fall he visited the entire region as far as leonardstown in st mary's county professing to be in search of land but really hunting up confederates upon whom he could depend at this time he bought a map a fellow to which i have seen among atzerodt's effects published at buffalo for the rebel government and marking at haphazard all the maryland villages but without tracing the high roads at all the absence of these roads it will be seen hereafter very nearly misled booth during his crippled flight it could not but have struck booth that this isolated part of maryland ignorant and rebel to the brim without telegraph or railways or direct stage routes belted with swamps and broken by dense timber afforded extraordinary opportunities for shelter and escape only the coast survey had any adequate map of it it was ultima thule to all intents and treason might subsist in welcome upon it for a thousand years when booth cast around him for assistance he naturally selected those men whom he could control the first that recommended himself was one herald a youth of inane and plastic character carried away by the example of an actor and full of execrable quotations going to show that he was an imitator of the master spirit both in text and admiration this herald was a gunner and therefore versed in arms he had traversed the whole lower portion of maryland and was therefore a geographer as well as a tool his friends lived at every farmhouse between washington and leonardsville and he was respectably enough connected so as to make his association creditable as well as useful harold whose picture i have seen is a dull-faced shallow boy smooth-haired and provincial he has no money nor employment except that he clerked for a druggist for a while until he knew wilkes booth who looked at him only once and bought his soul for a smile harold was infatuated by booth as a woman by a soldier he copied his gait and tone adopted his opinions and was unhappy out of his society booth gave him money mysteriously obtained and together they made the acquaintance of young john surratt son of the conspiratress young surratt does not appear to have been a puissant spirit in the scheme indeed all design and influence therein was absorbed by mrs surratt and booth the latter was the head and heart of the plot mrs surratt was his anchor and the rest of the boys were disciples to iscariot and jezebel john surratt a youth of strong southern physiognomy beardless and lanky knew of the murder and connived at it sam arnold and one mclaughlin were to have been parties to it but backed out in the end they all relied upon mrs surratt and took their cues from wilkes booth the conspiracy had its own time and kept its own counsel murder except among the principals was seldom mentioned except by genteel implication but they all publicly agreed that mr lincoln ought to be shot and that the north was a race of fratricides much was said of Brutus, and Booth repeated heroic passages to the delight of Harold, who learned them also, and wondered if he was not born to greatness. End of Letter 5, Part 1《The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth by George Alfred Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 5. 
A Solution of the Conspiracy Part Two In this growing darkness, where all rehearsed cold-hearted murder, Wilkes Booth grew great of stature. He had found a purpose consonant with his evil nature and bad influence over weak men, so he grew moodier, more vigilant, more plausible. By mien and temperament he was born to handle a stiletto. We have no face so markedly Italian. It would stand for Caesar Borgia at any day in the year. All the rest were swayed or persuaded by Booth. His schemes were three in order. First, to kidnap the President and Cabinet and run them south or blow them up. Second, kidnapping failed, to murder the President and the rest and seek shelter in the Confederate capital. Third, the rebellion failed to be its avenger and throw the country into consternation while he escaped by the unfrequented parts of Maryland. When this last resolution had been made, the plot was both contracted and extended. There were made two distinct circles of confidants, those aware of the meditated murder, and those who might shrink from murder, though willing accessories for a lesser object. Two colleagues for blood were at once accepted, Payne and Atzerodt. The former I have sketched. He is believed to have visited Washington once before, at Booth's citation, for the murder was at first fixed for the day of inauguration. Atzerodt was a fellow of German descent, who had led a desperate life at Port Tobacco, where he was a house painter. He had been a blockade runner across the Potomac and a mail carrier. When Booth and Mrs. Surratt broke the design to him with a suggestion that there was wealth in it, he embraced the offer at once, and bought a dirk and pistol. Payne also came from the north to Washington, and as fate would have it, the President was announced to appear at Ford's Theater in public. There the resolve of blood was reduced to a definite moment. On the night before the crime, Booth found on whom he could rely. John Surratt was sent northward by his mother on Thursday. Sam Arnold and McLaughlin, each of whom was to kill a cabinet officer, grew pigeon-livered and ran away. Harold, true to his partiality, lingered around Booth to the end. Atzerodt went so far as to take his knife and pistol to Kirkwood's, where President Johnson was stopping, and hid them under the bed. But either his courage failed or a trifling accident deranged his plan. But Payne, a professional murderer, stood game and fought his way over prostrate figures to his sick victim's bed. There was great confusion and terror among the tacit and rash conspirators on Thursday night. They had looked upon the plot as of a melodrama, and found to their horror that John Wilkes Booth meant to do murder. Six weeks before the murder, young John Surratt had taken two splendid repeating carbines to Surrettsville, and told John Lloyd to secrete them. The latter made a hole in the wainscoting and suspended them from strings, so that they fell within the plastered wall of the room below. On the very afternoon of the murder, Mrs. Surratt was driven to Surrattsville, and she told John Lloyd to have the carbines ready because they would be called for that night. Harold was made quartermaster and hired the horses. He and Atzerodt were mounted between eight o'clock and the time of the murder, and riding about the streets together. The whole party was prepared for a long ride, as their spurs and gauntlets show. It may have been their design to ride in company to the lower Potomac, and by their numbers exact subsistence and transportation. But all edifices of murder lack a cornerstone. We only know that Booth ate and talked well during the day, that he never seemed so deeply involved in oil, and that there is a hiatus between his supper here and his appearance at Ford's Theater. Lloyd, I may interpolate, ordered his wife a few days before the murder to go on a visit to Allen's Fresh. She says she does not know why she was so sent away, but swears that it is so. Harold, three weeks before the murder, visited Port Tobacco and said that the next time the boys heard of him he would be in Spain. He added that with Spain there was no extradition treaty. He said at Surrattsville that he meant to make a barrel of money, or his neck would stretch. Atzerodt said that if he ever came to Port Tobacco again he would be rich enough to buy the whole place. Wilkes Booth told a friend to go to Ford's on Friday night and see the best acting in the world. At Ford's Theater on Friday night there were many standers in the neighborhood of the door. 
and along the dress circle in the direction of the private box where the president sat. The play went on pleasantly, though Mr. Wilkes Booth, an observer of the audience, visited the stage and took note of the positions. His alleged associate, the stage carpenter, then received quiet orders to clear the passage by the wings from the prompter's post to the stage door. All this time Mr. Lincoln, in his family circle, unconscious of the death that crowded fast upon him, watched the pleasantry and smiled, and felt heartful of gentleness. Suddenly there was a murmur near the audience door, as of a man speaking above his bound. He said, Nine o'clock and forty-five minutes. These words were reiterated from mouth to mouth until they passed the theater door and were heard upon the sidewalk. Directly a voice cried in the same slightly raised monotone, Nine o'clock and fifty minutes. This also passed from man to man until it touched the street like a shudder. Nine o'clock and fifty-five minutes, said the same relentless voice after the next interval, each of which narrowed to a lesser span the life of the good president. Ten o'clock here sounded, and conspiring echo said in reverberation, Ten o'clock. So, like a creeping thing from lip to lip, went ten o'clock and five minutes, an interval, ten o'clock and ten minutes. At this instant, Wilkes Booth appeared in the door of the theater, and the men who had repeated the time so faithfully and so ominously scattered at his coming as at some warning phantom. Fifteen minutes afterwards, the telegraph wires were cut. All this is so dramatic that I fear to excite a laugh when I write it. But it is true and proven, and I do not say it, but report it. All evil deeds go wrong. While the click of the pistol taking the president's life went like a pang through the theater, Payne was spilling blood in Mr. Seward's house from threshold to sick chamber. But Booth's broken leg delayed him, or made him lose his general calmness, and he and Harold left Payne to his fate. I have not adverted to the whole board with a gimlet in the entry door of Mr. Lincoln's box and cut out with a penknife. The theory that the pistol ball of Booth passed through this hole is exploded, and the stage carpenter may have to answer for this little orifice with all his neck. For when Booth leaped from the box, he strode straight across the stage by the footlights, reaching the prompter's post, which is immediately behind that private box opposite Mr. Lincoln. From this box to the stage door in the rear, the passageway leads behind the ends of the scenes, and if generally either closed up by one or more withdrawn scenes, or so narrow that only by doubling and turning sideways can one pass along. On this fearful night, however, the scenes were so adjusted to the murderer's design that he had a free aisle from the foot of the stage to the exit door. Within fifteen minutes after the murder, the wires were severed entirely around the city excepting only a secret wire for government uses which leads to old point i am told by this wire the government reached the fortifications around washington first telegraphing all the way to old point and then back to the outlying forts this information comes to me from so many creditable channels that i must concede it payne having as he thought made an end of mr seward which would have been the case but for robinson the nurse mounted his horse and attempted to find booth but the town was in alarm, and he galloped at once for the open country, taking, as he imagined, the proper road for the East Branch. He rode at a killing pace, and when near Fort Lincoln on the Baltimore Pike, his horse threw him headlong. Afoot and bewildered, he resolved to return to the city, whose lights he could plainly see, but before doing so, he concealed himself some time and made some almost absurd efforts to disguise himself. Cutting a cross-section from the woolen undershirt which covered his muscular arm, he made a rude cap of it, and threw away his bloody coat. This has since been found in the woods, and blood has been found also on his bosom and sleeves. He also spattered himself plentifully with mud and clay, and taking an abandoned pick from the deserted entrenchments nearby, he struck at once for Washington. By the providence which always attends murder, he reached Mrs. Surratt's door just as the officers of the government were arresting her. They seized Payne at once, who had an awkward lie to urge in his defense that he had come there to dig a trench. That night he dug a trench, deep and broad enough for both of them to lie in forever. They washed his hands and found them soft and womanish. His pockets contained tooth and nail brushes and a delicate pocket-knife. All this apparel consorted ill with his assumed character. 
He is without doubt Mr. Seward's attempted murderer. Coarse and hard and calm, Mrs. Surratt shut up her house after the murder and waited with her daughters till the officers came. She was imperturbable, and rebuked her girls for weeping, and would have gone to jail like a statue, but that in her extremity Payne knocked at her door. He had come, he said, to dig a ditch for Mrs. Surratt, whom he very well knew. But Mrs. Surratt protested she had never seen the man at all, and had no ditch to clean. How fortunate, girls, she said, that these officers are here. This man might have murdered us all. Her affrontery stamps her as worthy of companionship with Booth. Payne has been identified by a lodger of Mrs. Surratt's as having twice visited the house under the name of Wood. The girls will render valuable testimony in the trial. If John Surratt were in custody, the links would be complete. Atzerott had a room almost directly over Vice President Johnson's. He had all the materials to do murder, but lost spirit or opportunity. He ran away so hastily that all his arms and baggage were discovered, a tremendous bowie knife and a Colt's cavalry revolver were found between the mattresses of his bed. Booth's coat was also found there, showing conspired flight in company, and in it three boxes of cartridges, a map of Maryland, gauntlet for riding, a spur, and a handkerchief marked with the name of Booth's mother, a mother's souvenir for a murderer's pocket. Atzerott fled alone and was found at the house of his uncle in Montgomery County. I do not know whether any instrument of murder has ever made me thrill as when I drew this terrible bowie knife from its sheath. Major O'Byrne of New York was the instigator of Atzerott's discovery and arrest. I come now to the ride out of the city by the chief assassin and his dupe. Harold met Booth immediately after the crime in the next street, and they rode at a gallop past the patent office and over Capitol Hill. As they crossed the eastern branch at Uniontown, Booth gave his proper name to the officer at the bridge. This, which would seem to have been foolish, was in reality very shrewd. The officers believed that one of Booth's accomplices had given this name in order to put them out of the real Booth's track, so they made efforts elsewhere, and so Booth got a start. At midnight, precisely, the two horsemen stopped at Surrettsville, Booth remaining on his nag while Harold descended and knocked hastily at the door. Lloyd, the landlord, came down at once, when Harold pushed past him into the bar and obtained a bottle of whiskey, some of which he gave to Booth immediately. While Booth was drinking, Harold went upstairs and brought down one of the carbines. Lloyd started to get the other, but Harold said, We don't want it. Booth has broken his leg and can't carry it. So the second carbine remained in the hall, where the officers afterward found it. As the two horsemen started to go off, Booth cried out to Lloyd, do you want to hear some news? I don't care much about it, cried Lloyd, by his own account. We have murdered, said Booth, the President and Secretary of State. And with this horrible confession, Booth and Harold dashed away in the midnight across Prince George's County. On Saturday, before sunrise, Booth and Harold, who had ridden all night without stopping elsewhere, reached the house of Dr. Mudd, three miles from Bryantown. They contracted with him for twenty-five dollars in greenbacks to set the broken leg. Harold, who knew Dr. Mudd, introduced Booth under another name, and stated that he had fallen from his horse during the night. The doctor remarked to Booth that he draped the lower part of his face while the leg was being set. He was silent and in pain. Having no splints in the house, they split up an old-fashioned wooden bandbox and prepared them. The doctor was assisted by an Englishman who at the same time began to hew out a pair of crutches. The inferior bone of the left leg was broken vertically across, and because vertically it did not yield when the crippled man walked upon it. The riding boot of Booth had to be cut from his foot. Within were the words J. Wilkes. The doctor says he did not notice these, but that visual defect may cost him his neck. The two men waited around the house all day, but toward evening they slipped their horses from the stable and rode away in the direction of Allen's Fresh. Below Bryantown run certain deep and slimy swamps. Along the belt of these Booth and Harold picked up a negro named Swan, who volunteered to show them the road for two dollars. They gave him five more to show them the route to Allen's Fresh, but really wished, as their actions intimated, to gain the house of one Sam Cox, a notorious rebel, 
and probably well advised of the plot. They reached the house at midnight. It is a fine dwelling, one of the best in Maryland, and after hallowing for some time, Cox came down to the door himself. As soon as he opened it and beheld who the strangers were, he instantly blew out a candle he held in his hand, and without a word pulled them into the house, the negro remaining in the yard. The Confederates remained in Cox's house until 4 a.m., during which time the negro saw them drink and eat heartily, but when they reappeared they spoke in a loud tone, so that Swan could hear them, against the hospitality of Cox. All this was meant to influence the darky, but their motives were as apparent as their words. He conducted them three miles further on, when they told him that now they knew the way, and giving him five dollars more, making twelve in all, told him to go back. But when the negro, in the dusk of the morning, looked after them as he receded, he saw that both horses' heads were turned once more toward Cox's, and it was this man, doubtless, who harbored the fugitives from Sunday to Thursday, aided, possibly, by such neighbors as the Wilsons and the Adamses. At the point where Booth crossed the Potomac, the shores are very shallow, and one must wade out some distance to where a boat will float. A white man came up here with a canoe on Friday and tied it by a stone anchor. Between seven and eight o'clock it disappeared, and in the afternoon some men at work in Virginia saw Booth and Harold land, tie the boat's rope to a stone, and fling it ashore, and strike at once across a ploughed field for King George Courthouse. Many folks entertained them without doubt, but we positively hear of them next at Port Royal Ferry, and then at Garrett's Farm. I close this article with a list of all who were at Garrett's farm on the death of Booth. 1. E.J. Conger, Detectives. 2. Lieutenant Baker. 3. Surgeon from Port Royal. 4. Four Garrett Daughters. 5. Harold, Booth's accomplice. Soldiers. Company H, 16th New York Volunteer Cavalry. Lieutenant Ed P. Doherty commanding, Corporals A. Newgarten, J. Wally, M. Hornsby. Privates J. Mellington, D. Darker, E. Parlays, W. Mockgart. Corporals Zimmer, Company C. M. Tainek. Privates H. Pardman, J. Myers, W. Byrne, F. Meekdank, G. H., J. Rayen, J. Kelly, J. Samger, Company M., G. Zeitkin, Steinberry, L. Sweech, Company A., A. Sweech, Company H., F. Diacts, Sergeant Wandell, Corporals, Lanarkey, Winnerkey, Sergeant Corbett, Company L. Sergeant Corbett, who shot Booth, was the only man of the command belonging to the same company with Lieutenant Doherty, Commandant. End of Letter 5「The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth » by George Alfred Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 6. The Detective's Stories. Washington, May 2nd, P.M. The police resources of the country have been fairly tested during the past two weeks. Under the circumstances, the shrewdness and energy of both municipal and national detectives have been proven good. The latter body has had a too partial share of the applause thus far while the efforts of our New York and other officers have been overlooked. In the crowning success of Doherty, Conger, and Baker on the Virginia side of the water, we have forgotten the as vigorous and better sustained pursuit on the Maryland side. Yet the Secretary of War has thanked all concerned, especially referring to many excellent leaders in the long hunt through Charles and St. Mary's counties. Here the military and civil forces together amounted to quite a small army, and constituted by far the largest police organization ever known on this side of the Atlantic. I think the adventures and expedients of these public servants worthy of a column. It would be out of all proportion to pass them by when we devote a dozen lines to every petty larceny and shoplifting. On the Friday night of the murder, the departments were absolutely paralyzed. The murderers had three good hours for escape, they had evaded the pursuit of lightning by snapping the telegraph wires, and rumor filled the town with so many reports that the first valuable hours, which should have been used to follow hard after them, were consumed in feverish efforts to know the real extent of the assassination. 
Immediately afterwards, however, or on Saturday morning early, the Provo and Special Police Force got on the scent, and military in squads were dispatched close upon their heels. Three grand pursuits were organized. One reaching up the north bank of the Potomac toward Chain Bridge, to prevent escape by that direction into Virginia, where Mosby, it was suspected, waited to hail the murderers. The second, starting from Richmond, Virginia, northward, forming a broad advancing picket or skirmish line between the Blue Ridge and the broad sea-running streams. A third to scour the peninsula toward Point Lookout. The latter region became the only one well examined. The northern expedition failed until advised from below to capture Atzerott, and failed to capture Payne. Yet there were cogent probabilities that the assassin had taken this route for Mosby would have given them the right hand of fellowship. When that guerrilla heard of Booth's feet, and Captain Jett, he exclaimed, Now by blank, I could take that man in my arms. Washington, as a precautionary measure, was doubly picketed at once. The authorities in all northern towns advised of the personnel of the murderer, and requests made of the detective chiefs in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, to forward to Washington without delay their best decoys. A court of inquiry was organized on the moment, and early in the week succeeding rewards were offered. An individual, and not the government, offered the first rewards. There were two men without whom the hunt would have gone astray many times. John S. Young, chief of the New York detective force, a powerful and resolute man, whose great weight and strength are matched by boundless energy, and both subordinate to a head as clear as the keen and searching warrant of his eye. This man has been in familiar converse with every rebel agent in the Canadas, and is feared by them as they fear the fates of Beale and Kennedy. Without being a sensationist, he has probably rendered the cleverest services of the war to the general government. They sent for him immediately after the tragedy, and he stopped on the way for his old police companion, Marshal Murray. The latter's face and figure are familiar to all who know New York. He resembles an admiral on his quarter-deck. He is a detective of fair and excellent repute, and has a somewhat novel pride in what he calls the most beautiful gallows in the United States. These officials were ordered to visit Colonel Ingraham's office and examine the little evidence on hand. They and their tried officers formed a junction on Sunday afternoon with the large detective force of Provo Marshal Major O'Byrne. The latter commands the District of Columbia Civil and Military Police. He is a New Yorker, and has been shot through the body in the field. The detective force of Young and Murray consisted of officers Radford, Kelso, Elder, and Hoey, of New York, Deputy Marshal Newcomb, formerly of the World's City Staff, officers Joseph Pearson and West of Baltimore. Major O'Byrne's immediate aides were detectives John Lee, Lloyd, Gavigan, Cottingham, and Williams. A detachment of the Philadelphia Detective Police Force, officers Taggart, George Smith, and Carlin, reporting to Colonel Baker, went in the direction of the North Pole. Everybody is on the Q-Vive for them. To the Provo Marshal of Baltimore, MacPhail, who knew the tone and bearing of the country throughout, was joined the zealous cooperation of Officer Lloyd, of Major O'Byrne's staff, who had a personal feeling against the secessionists of Lower Maryland. They had once driven him away from his loyalty, and had reserved their hospitality for assassins. Lieutenant Commander Gushing, I am informed, also rendered important services to the government in connection with the police operations. Volunteer detectives, such as ex-Marshal Lewis and Angelus, were plentiful. It is probable that in the pitch of the excitement five hundred detective officers were in and around Washington City. At the same time, the secret police of Richmond abandoned their ordinary business and devoted themselves solely to this overshadowing offense. No citizen in these terrible days knows what eyes were upon him as he talked and walked, nor how his stature and guise were keenly scanned by folks who passed him absent-faced, yet with his mental portrait carefully turned over, the while some invisible hand clutched a revolver and held a life-or-death challenge upon his lips. 
The military forces were commanded by Colonel Wells of the 26th Michigan Regiment, whose activity and zeal were amply sustained by Colonel Clendenning of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, probably the finest body of horse in the service. The first party to take the South Maryland Road was dispatched by Major O'Byrne and commanded by Lieutenant Lovett of the Veteran Reserves. It consisted of 25 cavalrymen, with Detectives Cottingham, Lloyd, and Gavigan. These latter, with the lieutenant, kept well in advance. They made inquiries of a soothing and cautious character, but saw nothing suspicious until they arrived at Piscataway, where an unknown man, some distance ahead, observed them and took to the woods. This was on Sunday night, forty hours after the murder. Guided by Officer Lloyd, the little band dashed on, arriving at Bryantown on Tuesday. Here they arrested John Lloyd, of the hotel at Surrattsville, of whom they had previously inquired for the murderers, and he had said positively that he neither knew them nor had seen anybody whatever on the night of the crime. He was returning in a wagon with his wife, whom he had ordered the day before to go on a visit to Allen's Fresh. The Monday afterward he started to bring her back. This woman, frightened at the arrest, acknowledged at once that in her husband's conduct there had been inexplicable mystery. He was taciturn and defiant, as before, until confronted by some of his old Union neighbors. The few Unionists of Prince George's and Charles Counties, long persecuted and intimidated, now came forward and gave important testimony. Among these was one Roby, a very fat and very zealous old gentleman, whose professions were as ample as his perspiration. He told the officers of the secret meetings for conspiracy's sake at Lloyd's Hotel, and although a very John Gilpin on horseback rode here and there to his great loss of wind and repose, fastening fire coals upon the guilty or suspected. Lloyd was turned over to Mr. Cottingham, who had established a jail at Robytown. That night his house was searched and Booth's carbine found hidden in the wall. Three days later Lloyd himself confessed, and his neck is quite nervous at this writing. This little party, under the untiring Lovett, examined all the farmhouses below Washington, resorting to many shrewd expedients and taking note of the great swamps to the east of Port Tobacco. They reached Newport at last, and fastened tacit guilt upon many residents. Beyond Bryantown they overhauled the residence of Dr. Mudd and found Booth's boot. This was before Lloyd confessed, and was the first positive trace the officers had that they were really close upon the assassins. I do not recall anything more wild and startling than this vague and dangerous exploration of a dimly known hostile and ignorant country. To these few detectives we owe much of the subsequent successful prosecution of the pursuit. They were the Hebrew spies. By this time the country was filling up with soldiers, but previously a second memorable detective party went out under the personal command of Major O'Byrne. It consisted, besides that officer, of Lee, D'Angelia, Callahan, Hoy, Bostick, Hanover, Bevins, and McHenry, and embarked at Washington on a steam tug for Chapel's Point. Here a military station had long been established for the prevention of blockade and mail running across the Potomac. It was commanded by Lieutenant Laverty, and garrisoned by sixty-five men. On Tuesday night Major O'Byrne's party reached this place, and soon afterwards a telegraph station was established here by an invaluable man to the expedition, Captain Beckwith, General Grant's chief cipher operator, who tapped the point lookout wire and placed the War Department within a moment's reach of the theater of events. Major O'Byrne's party started at once over the worst road in the world for Port Tobacco. If any place in the world is utterly given over to depravity, it is Port Tobacco. From this town, by a sinuous creek, there is flatboat navigation to the Potomac, and across that river to Mattox's Creek. Before the war, Port Tobacco was the seat of a tobacco aristocracy and a haunt of Negro traders. It passed very naturally into a rebel post for blockade runners and a rebel post office general. Gambling, corner fighting, and shooting matches were its lyceum education. Violence and ignorance had every suffrage in the town. Its people were smugglers to all intents, and there was neither Bible nor geography to the whole region adjacent. 
assassination was never very unpopular at port tobacco and when its victim was a northern president it became quite heroic a month before the murder a provost marshal nearby was slain in his bedchamber for such a town and district the detective police were the only effective missionaries the hotel here is called the brawner house it has a bar in the nethermost cellar and its patrons carousing in that imperfect light look like the denizens of some burglar's crib talking robbery between their cups its dining-room is dark and tumble down and the cuisine bears traces of kaffir origin a barbecue is nothing to a dinner there the courthouse of port tobacco is the most superfluous house in the place except the church it stands in the centre of the town in a square and the dwellings lie about it closely as if to throttle justice five hundred people exist in port tobacco life there reminds me in connection with the slimy river and the adjacent swamps of the great reptile period of the world when iguanodons and pterodactyls and pleosauri ate each other into this abstract of gomorrah the few detectives went like angels who visited lot they pretended to be inquiring for friends or to have business designs and the first people they heard of were Harold and Atzerodt. The latter had visited Port Tobacco three weeks before the murder, and intimated at that time his design of fleeing the country. But everybody denied having seen him subsequent to the crime. Atzerodt had been in town just prior to the crime. He had been living with a widow woman named Mrs. Wheeler, by whom he had several children, and she was immediately called upon by Major O'Byrne. He did not tell her what Atzerodt had done, but vaguely hinted that he had committed some terrible crime, and that since he had done her wrong, she could vindicate both herself and justice by telling his whereabouts. The woman admitted that Atzerodt had been her bane, but she loved him and refused to betray him. His trunk was found in her garret, and in it the key to his paint shop in Port Tobacco. The latter was fruitlessly searched, but the probable whereabouts of Atzerodt in Montgomery County obtained and Major O'Byrne telegraphing there immediately, the desperate fellow was found and locked up. A man named Crangle, who had succeeded Atzerodt in Mrs. Wheeler's pliable affections, was arrested at once and put in jail. A number of disloyal people were indicated or spotted, as in no wise angry at the President's taking off, and for all such a provo prison was established. A few miles from Port Tobacco dwelt a solitary woman, who, when questioned, said that for many nights she had heard, after she had retired to bed, a man enter her cellar and lie there all night, departing before dawn. Major O'Byrne and the detectives ordered her to place a lamp in her window the next night she heard him enter, and at dark they established a cordon of armed officers around the place. At midnight punctually she exhibited the light, when the officers broke into the house and thoroughly searched it without result. Yet the woman positively asserted that she had heard the man enter. It was afterward found that she was of diseased mind. By this time the military had come up in considerable numbers, and Major O'Byrne was enabled to confer with Major Waite of the 8th Illinois. The Major had pushed on Monday night to Leonardstown, and pretty well overhauled that locality. It was at this time that preparations were made to hunt the swamps around Chapmantown, Beantown, and Allen's Fresh. Booth had been entirely lost since his departure from Mudd's house, and it was believed that he had either pushed on for the Potomac or taken to the swamps. The officers sagaciously determined to follow him to the one and to explore the other. The swamps tributary to the various branches of the Wicomico River, of which the chief feeder is Allen's Creek, bear various names such as Jordan's Swamp, Atchall's Swamp, and Scrub Swamp. They are dense growths of dogwood, gum, and beech, planted in sluices of water and bog, and their width varies from a half mile to four miles, while their length is upwards of sixteen miles. Frequent deep ponds dot this wilderness place, with here and there a stretch of dry soil, but no human being inhabits the malarious extent. Even a hunted murderer would shrink from hiding there serpents and slimy lizards are the only denizens sometimes the coon takes refuge in this desert from the hounds and in the soil mud a thousand odorous muskrats delve with now and then a 
tremorous otter. But not even the hunted negro dares to fathom the treacherous clay, nor make himself a fellow of the slimy reptiles which reign absolute in this terrible solitude. Here the soldiers prepared to seek for the president's assassin, and no search of the kind has ever been so thorough and patient. The Shawnee, in his stronghold of despair in the heart of Okefenokee, would scarcely have changed homes with Wilkes Booth and David Harold hiding in this inhuman country. The military forces deputed to pursue the fugitives were seven hundred men of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, six hundred men of the 22nd Colored Troops, and one hundred men of the 16th New York. These swept the swamps by detachments, the mass of them dismounted, with cavalry at the belts of clearing, interspersed with detectives at frequent intervals in the rear. They first formed a strong picket cordon, entirely around the swamps, and then, drawn up in two orders of battle, advanced boldly into the bogs by two lines of march. One party swept the swamps longitudinally, the other pushed straight across their smallest diameter. A similar march has not been made during the war. The soldiers were only a few paces apart, and in steady order they took the ground as it came, now plunging to their armpits in foul sluices of gangrened water, now hopelessly submerged in slime, now attacked by regions of wood ticks, now tempting some unfaithful log or greenishly solid morass, and plunging to the tip of the skull in poison stagnation. The tree boughs rent their uniforms. They came out upon dry land, many of them without a rag of garment, scratched and gashed and spent, repugnant to themselves and disgusting to those who saw them. But not one trace of Booth or Herald was anywhere found. Wherever they might be, the swamps did not contain them. While all this was going on, a force started from Point Lookout and swept the narrow necks of St. Mary's quite up to Medley's Neck. To complete the search in this part of the country, Colonel Wells and Major O'Byrne started with a force of cavalry and infantry for Chapel Point. They took the entire peninsula as before and marched in close skirmish line across it, but without finding anything of note. The matter of enclosing a house was by cavalry advances, which held up all the avenues till mounted detectives came up. Many strange and ludicrous adventures occurred on each of these expeditions. While the forces were going up Cobb's neck, there was a counter-force coming down from Allen's Fresh. Major O'Byrne started for Leonardstown with his detective force, and played off Laverty as Booth, and Hoey as Harold. These two advanced to farmhouses and gave their assumed names, asking at the same time for assistance and shelter. They were generally avoided, except by one man named Claggert, who told them they might hide in the woods behind his house. When Claggert was arrested, however, he stated that he meant to hide them only to give them up. While on this adventure a man who had heard of the reward came very near shooting Laverty. The ruse now became hazardous, and the detectives resumed their real characters. I have not time to go into the detail of this long and excellent hunt. My letter of yesterday described how the detectives of Mr. Young and Marshal Murray examined the Negro, Swan, and traced Booth to the house of Sam Cox, the richest rebel in Charles County. There is a gap in the evidence between the arrival of Booth at this place and his crossing the Potomac above Swan Point in a stolen or purposely provided canoe. But as Cox's house is only ten miles from the river, it is possible that he made the passage of the intermediate country undiscovered. One Mills, a rebel mail carrier, was arrested, saw Booth and Harold lurking along the river bank on Friday. He referred Major O'Byrne to the one Claggart, a rebel, as having seen them also, but Claggart held his tongue and went to jail. On Saturday night, Major O'Byrne, thus assured, also crossed the Potomac with his detectives to Boone's farm, where the fugitives had landed. While collecting information here, a gunboat swung up the stream and threatened to fire on the party. It was now night, and all the party worn to the ground with long travel and want of sleep. Lieutenant Laverty's men went a short distance down the country and gave up, but Major O'Byrne, with a single man, pushed all night to King George's Courthouse, and next day, Sunday, re-embarked for Chapel's Point. Hence he telegraphed his information and asked permission to pursue, promising to catch the assassins before they reached Port Royal. 
This the department refused. Colonel Baker's men were delegated to make the pursuit with the able Lieutenant Doherty, and O'Byrne, who was the most active and successful spirit in the case, returned to Washington, cheerful and contented. At Mrs. Surratt's Washington House, at the Pennsylvania Hotel, Washington, and at Surrattsville, the Booth plot was almost entirely arranged. These three places will be relics of conspiracy forever. Harold said to Lieutenant Doherty, after the latter had dragged him from the farm, Who's that man in there? It can't be Booth. He told me his name was Lloyd. He further said that he had begged food for Booth from house to house while the latter hid in the woods. The Confederate captain, Willie Jett, who had given Booth a lift behind his saddle from Port Royal to Garrett's farm, was then courting a Miss Goldman at Bowling Green. His traveling companions were Lieutenants Ruggles and Burbridge. Payne, the assassin of the Sewards, was arrested by officers Sampson of the sub-treasury and DeVoe, acting under General Alcott. The latter had besides officers Marsh and Clancy, a stenographer. The reward for the capture of Booth will be distributed between very many men. The Negro, Swan, will get as much of it as he deserves. It amounts to about $80,000, but the War Department may increase it at discretion. The entire rewards amount to a hundred and sixty-odd thousand. Major O'Byrne should get a large part of it as well. This story, which I must close abruptly, deserves to be rewritten with all its accessory endeavors. What I have said is in skeleton merely, and far from exhaustive. End of Letter 6「The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth » by George Alfred Townsend This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 7. The Martyr. Washington, May 14. I am sitting in the President's office. He was here very lately, but he will not return to dispossess me of this high-back chair he filled so long nor resume his daily work at the table where I am writing. There are here only Major Hay and the friend who accompanies me. A bright-faced boy runs in and out, darkly attired, so that his fob chain of gold is the only relief to his morning garb. This is little Tad, the pet of the White House. That great death with which the world rings has made upon him only the light impression which all things make upon childhood. He will live to be a man pointed out everywhere, for his father's sake, and as folks look at him the tableau of the murder will seem to encircle him. The room is long and high, and so thickly hung with maps that the color of the wall cannot be discerned. The President's table, at which I am seated, adjoins a window at the farthest corner, and to the left of my chair as I recline in it uh, there is a large table before an empty grate around which there are many chairs where the cabinet used to assemble. The carpet is trodden thin, and the brilliance of its dyes is lost. The furniture is of the formal cabinet class, stately and semi-comfortable. There are bookcases sprinkled with the sparse library of a country lawyer, but largely plethoric, like the thin body which has departed in its coffin. They are taking away Mr. Lincoln's private effects, to deposit them wheresoever his family may abide, and the emptiness of the place on this sunny Sunday revives that feeling of desolation from which the land has scarce recovered. I rise from my seat and examine the maps. They are from the Coast Survey and Engineer Departments, and exhibit all the contested grounds of the war. There are pencil lines upon them where someone has traced the route of armies, and planned the strategic circumferences of campaigns. Was it the dead president who so followed the march of empire and dotted the sites of shock and overthrow? Here is Manassas country. Here the long reach of the wasted Shenandoah. Here the wavy line of the James and the sinuous peninsula. The wide campagna of the Gulf country sways in the Potomac breeze that filters in at the window. And the Mississippi climbs up the wall with blotches of blue and red to show where blood gushed at the bursting of deadly bombs. So in the half-gloomy, half-grand apartment roamed the tall and wrinkled figure whom the country had summoned from his plain home 
into mighty history. With the geography of the Republic drawn into a narrow compass so that he might lay his great brown hand upon it everywhere. And walking to and fro, to and fro, to measure the destinies of arms, he often stopped with his thoughtful eyes upon the carpet to ask if his life were real, and if he were the arbiter of so tremendous issues, or whether it was not all a fever dream, snatched from his sofa in the routine office of the prairie state. There is but one picture on the marble mantel over the cold grate, John Bright, a photograph. I can well imagine how the mind of Mr. Lincoln often went afar to the face of Bright, who said so kindly things of him when Europe was mocking his homely guise and provincial phraseology. To Mr. Lincoln, John Bright was the standard-bearer of America and democracy in the old world. He thrilled over Bright's bold denunciations of peer and privilege, and stretched his long arm across the Atlantic to take that daring Quaker innovator by the hand. I see some books on the table. Perhaps they have lain there undisturbed since the reader's dimming eyes grew nerveless. A parliamentary manual, a thesaurus, and two books of humor, Orpheus C. Kerr and Artemis Ward. These last were read by Mr. Lincoln in the pauses of his hard day's labor. Their tenure here bears out the popular verdict of his partiality for a good joke, and through the window from the seat of Mr. Lincoln I see across the grassy grounds of the Capitol the broken shaft of the Washington Monument, the Long Bridge, and the fort-tipped heights of Arlington, reaching down to the shining riverside. These scenes he looked at often to catch some freshness of leaf and water, and often raised the sash to let the world rush in where only the nation abided, and hence on that awful night he departed early, to forget this room and its close applications in the abandon of the theatre. I wonder if that were the least of Booth's crimes, to slay this public service in the stolen hour of recreation he enjoyed but seldom. We worked his life out here and killed him when he asked a holiday. Outside of this room there is an office where his secretaries sat, a room more narrow but as long, and opposite this adjacent office a second door directly behind Mr. Lincoln's chair leads to a private passage to his family quarters. This passage is his only monument in the building. He added nor subtracted nothing else. It tells a long story of duns and loiterers, contract hunters and seekers for commissions, garrulous parents on paltry errands, toadies without measure, and talkers without conscience. They pressed upon him through the great door opposite his window, and, hat in hand, came curtsying to his chair with an obsequious Mr. President. If he dared, though the chief magistrate and commander of the army and navy, to go out of the great door, these vampires leaped upon him with their Babylonian pleas, and barred his walk to his hearth side. He could not insult them, since it was not in his nature, and perhaps many of them had really urgent errands. So he called up the carpenter and ordered a strategic route cut from his office to his hearth, and perhaps told of it after with much merriment. Here should be written the biography of his official life, in the room where have concentrated all the wires of action, and where have proceeded the resolves which vitalized in historic deeds. But only the great measures, however carried out, were conceived in this office. The little ones proceeded from other places. Here once came Mr. Stanton, saying, in his hard and positive way, Mr. Lincoln, I have found it expedient to disgrace and arrest General Stone. Stanton, said Mr. Lincoln, with an emotion of pain, when you considered it necessary to imprison General Stone, I am glad you did not consult me about it. And for lack of such consultation, General Stone, I learn, now lies a maniac in the asylum. The groundless pretext upon which he suffered the reputation of treason issued from the Department of War, not from this office. But as to his biography, it is to be written by Colonel Nicolay and Major Hay. They are to go to Paris together, one as attaché of legation, the other as consul, and while there will undertake the labor. They are the only men who know his life well enough to exhaust it, having followed his official tasks as closely as they shared his social hours. 
Major Hay is a gentleman of literary force. Colonel Nicolay has a fine judgment of character and public measures. Together they should satisfy both curiosity and history. As I hear from my acquaintances here these episodes of the President's life, I recall many reminiscences of his ride from Springfield to Harrisburg, over much of which I passed. Then he left home and became an inhabitant of history. His face was solid and healthy, his step young, his speech and manner bold and kindly. I saw him at Trenton stand in the legislature and say, in his conversational intonation, we may have to put the foot down firm. How should we have hung upon his accents then had we anticipated his virtues and his fate? Death is requisite to make opinion grave. We looked upon Mr. Lincoln then as an amusing sensation, and there was much guffaw as he was regarded by the populace. He had not passed out of partisan ownership. Little by little afterward he won esteem and often admiration until the measure of his life was full, and the victories he had achieved made the world applaud him. Yet at this date the President was sadly changed. Four years of perplexity and devotion had wrinkled his face and stooped his shoulders, and the failing eyes that glared upon the play closed as his mission was completed and the world had been educated enough to comprehend him. The White House has been more of a Republican mansion under his control than for many administrations. Uncouth guests came to it often, typical of the simple Western civilization of which he was a graduate, and while no coarse altercation has ever ensued, the portal has swung wide for five years. A friend, connected with a Washington newspaper, told me that he had occasion to see Mr. Lincoln one evening, and found that the latter had gone to bed, but he was told to sit down in the office, and directly the President entered. He wore only a nightshirt, and his long, lank, hair-suit limbs, as he sat down, inclined the guest to laughter. Mr. Lincoln disposed of his request at once, and manifested a desire to talk. So he reached for the cane which my friend carried, and conversed in this manner. I always used a cane when I was a boy. It was a freak of mine. A favorite one was a knotted beech stick, and I carved the head myself. There's a mighty amount of character in sticks, don't you think so? You have seen these fishing poles that fit into a cane? Well, that was an old idea of mine. Dogwood clubs were favorite ones with the boys. I suppose they use them yet. Hickory is too heavy, unless you get it from a young sapling. Have you ever noticed how a stick in one's hand will change his appearance? Old women and witches wouldn't look so without sticks. Meg Merrilly understands that. In this way, my friend, who is a clerk in a newspaper office, heard the president talk for an hour. The undress of the man and the witness of his subject would be staples for merriment if we did not reflect that his greatness was of no conventional caste that the playfulness of his nature and the simplicity of his illustration lightened public business, but never arrested it. Another gentleman whom I know visited the President in high dudgeon one night. He was a newspaper proprietor, and one of his editors had been arrested. Mr. Lincoln, he said, I have been off electioneering for your re-election, and in my absence you have had my editor arrested. I won't stand it, sir. I have fought better administrations than yours. Why, uh, John, said the President, I don't know much about it. Uh, I suppose your boys have been too enterprising. The fact is, I don't interfere with the press much, but I suppose I am responsible. I want you to order that man's release tonight, said the applicant. I shan't leave here till I get it. In fact, I am the man who should be arrested. Why don't you send me to Capitol Hill? The idea pleased the President exceedingly. He laughed the other into good humor. In fact, he said, I am under restraint here and glad of any pretext to release a journalist. So he wrote the order and the writer got his liberty. It must not be inferred from this, however, that the President was a devotee to literature. He had no professional enthusiasm for it. The literary coterie of the White House got little flattery, but its members were treated as agreeable citizens and not as the architects of anybody's fortune. Willis went there much for a while, but yielded to his old habit of gossiping about the hall paper and the teapots. Emerson went there once, 
and was deferred to as if he were anything but a philosopher. Yet he so far grasped the character of his host as to indict that noble humanitarian eulogy upon him, delivered at Concord, and printed in The World. It will not do to say definitely, in this notice, how several occasional writers visited the White House, heard the President's views, and assented to them, and afterward abused him. But these attained no remembrance nor tart reproach from that least retaliatory of men. He harbored no malice, and is said to have often placed himself on the standpoint of Davis and Lee, and accounted for their defection, while he could not excuse it. He was a good reader, and took all the leading New York dailies every day. His secretaries perused them and selected all the items which would interest the President. These were read to him and considered. He bought few new books, but seemed ever alive to works of comic value. The vein of humor in him was not boisterous in its manifestations, but touched the geniality of his nature, and he reproduced all that he absorbed to elucidate some new issue, to turn away argument by a laugh. As a jester, Mr. Lincoln's tendency was caricatured by the prince, but not exaggerated. He probably told as many stories as are attributed to him. Nor did he, as is averred, indulge in these jests on solemn occasions. No man felt with such personal intensity the extent of the casualties of his time, and he often gravely reasoned whether he could be in any way responsible for the bloodshed and devastation over which it was his duty to preside. An acquaintance of mine, a private, once went to him to plead for a man's life. He had never seen the man for whom he pleaded, and had no acquaintance with the man's family. Mr. Lincoln was touched by his disinterestedness, and said to him, "'If I were anything but the President, I would be constantly working as you have done.' Whenever a doubt of one's guilt lay on his mind, the man was spared by his direct interference." There was an entire absence in the President's character of the heroic element. He would do a great deed in deshabille as promptly as in full dress. He never aimed to be brilliant, unconsciously understanding that a great man's brilliancy is to be measured by the wholeness and synthetic cast of his career, rather than by any fitful ebullitions. For that reason we look in vain through his messages for points. His point was not to turn a sentence or an epigram, but to win an effect, regardless of the route to it. He was commonplace in his talk, and Chesterfield would have had no patience with him. His dignity of character lay in his uprightness rather than in his formal manner. Members of his government often reviewed him plainly in his presence. Yet he divined the true course, while they only argued it out. His good feeling was not only personal but national. He had no prejudice against any race or potentate, and his democracy was of a practical rather than of a demonstrative nature. He was not Marat, but Moreau, not Paine and Jefferson, but Franklin. His domestic life was like a parlor of night-time, lit by the equal grate of his genial and uniform kindness. Young Thaddy played with him upon the carpet. Robert came home from the war and talked to his father as to a schoolmate. He was to Mrs. Lincoln as chivalrous on the last day of his life as when he courted her. I have somewhere seen a picture of Henri Quatre of France, riding his babies on his back. That was the President. So dwelt the citizen who is gone, a model in character if not in ceremony. For good men to come who will take his place in the same White House and find their generation comparing them to the man thought worthy of assassination. I am glad to sit here in his chair, where he is bent so often, in the atmosphere of the household he purified, in the sight of the green grass and the blue river he hallowed by gazing upon, in the very center of the nation he preserved for the people, and closed the list of bloody deeds, of desperate fights of swift expiations, of renowned obsequies of which I have written, by indicting at this table the goodness of his life and the eternity of his memory. End of Letter 7 
the life crime and capture of john wilkes booth by george alfred townsend this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain letter eight the trial washington may twenty six the most exciting trial of our times has obtained a very meagre commemoration in all but its literal features the evidence adduced in the course of it has been too faithfully reported through its far-fetched and monotonous irregularities but nobody realizes the extraordinary scene from which so many columns emanate either by aid of the reporter's scanty descriptions or by the pure blind sketches of the artists now that the evidence is growing vapid and the obstinacy of the military commission has lost its coarse zest we may find enough readers to warrant a fuller sketch of the conspirators prison about a mile below washington where the high potomac bluffs meet the marshy border of the eastern branch stands the united states arsenal a series of long mathematically uninteresting brick buildings with a broad lawn behind them open to the water and level military plazas on which are piled pyramids of shell and ball among acres of cannon and cannon carriages and caissons a high wall reaching circularly around these buildings shows above it as one looks from washington the barred windows of an older and more gloomy structure than the rest which forms the city front of the group of which it is the principal this is the penitentiary but long ago added to the arsenal it has been retransformed to a courtroom and jail and in its third or uppermost story the military commission is sitting the main road to the arsenal is by a wide and vacant avenue which abuts against a gate where automaton sentries walk but the same gate can best be reached on foot by the shores of the potomac in the sight of the forts the shipping and alexandria the scene at the arsenal in time of peace is commonplace enough except that across the eastern branch the towers of the lunatic asylum perched upon a height look down baronially but this trial of murderers has made the spot a fair a whole company of volunteers keeps the gate through which are passing cabs barouches officers ambulances and a stream of folks on foot while further along almost a regiment crosses the drive their huddled shelter tents extending entirely across the peninsula these are playing cards on the ground and tossing quoits and sleeping on their faces while a gunboat watches the river front and under a circular wall a line of patrols ten yards apart go to and fro perpetually it is ten o'clock and the court is soon to sit its members ride down in superb ambulances and bring their friends along to show them the majesty of justice. A perfect park of carriages stands by the door to the left, and from these dismount Major General's wives in rustling silks, daughters of congressmen, attired like the lilies of the milliner, little girls who hope to be young ladies and have come with Pa to look at the assassins. Even brides are here, in the fresh blush of their nuptials, and they consider the late spectacle of the review as good as lost if the court scene be not added to it these tender creatures have a weakness for the ring of manacles the sight of folks to be suspended in the air the face of a woman confederate in blood they chat with their polite guides many of whom are gallant captains and go one after another up the little flight of steps which leads to the room of the officer of the day he passes them, if he pleases, up the crooked stairways, and when they have climbed three of these, they enter a sort of garret room, oblong and plastered white, and about as large as an ordinary townhouse parlor. Four doors open into it, that by which we have entered, two from the left where the witnesses wait, and one at the end, near the left far corner, which is the outlet from the cells. A railing close up to the stairway door gives a little space in the foreground for witnesses. Two tables transverse to this rail are for the commission and the press, the first named being to the right. Between these are a raised platform and pivot armchair for the witness. Below are the sworn phonographers and the counsel for the accused. And then another rail like that separating the crowd from the court holds behind it the accused and their guards 
These are they who are living not by years nor by weeks, but by breaths. They are motley enough, for the most part, sitting along a long bench with their backs against the wall, ill-shaved, haggard, anxious, and the dungeon door at their left opens now and then to show behind it a moving bayonet. There are women within the court proper, edging upon the reporters, introduced there by a fussy usher, and through four windows filters the imperfect daylight, making all things distinguishable, yet shadowy. The coup d'oeil of this small and crowded scene is lively as a popular funeral. There is the witness with raised hand pointing toward heaven and looking at Judge Holt. The gilt stars, bars, and orange-colored sashes of the commission, the women's brilliant silks and bonnets, the crowding spectators with their brains in their eyes, the blue coats of the guards, the working scribes, and last of all the line of culprits whose suspected guilt has made them worthy of all illustration. Between the angle of the wall and the studded door, under the heavy bar of dressed stone which marks above the thickness of the jail, sits all alone a woman's figure, clothed in solemn black. Her shadowy skirt hides her feet so that we cannot see whether they are riveted. Her sleeves of sable sweep down to her wrist, and dark gloves cover the plumpness of her hand while a palm-leaf fan nods to and fro to assist the obscurity of her veil of crape descending from her widow's bonnet. A solitary woman, beginning the line of coarse indicted men, shrinking beneath the scornful eyes of her sex, and the as-bold survey of men more pitiful, may well excite, despite her guilt, a moment of sympathy. Let men remember that she is the mother of a son who has fled to save his forfeit life by deserting her to shame, and perhaps to death. Let women, who will not mention her in mercy, learn from her end in all succeeding wars to make patriotism of their household duties and not incite to blood. Mrs. Surratt is a graduate of that seminary which spits in soldiers' faces, denounces brave generals upon the rostrum, and cries out for an interminable scaffold when all the bells are ringing peace. How far her wicked love influenced her to participation in the murder rests in her own breast, and up to this time she has not differed from mothers at large, to twist her own bowstring rather than build his gibbet. Beneath her shadowy bonnet over her fan tip we see two large sad eyes, rising and falling, and now and then when the fan sways to and fro, the hair just turning gray with trouble, and the round face growing wan and seamed with terrible reflection, are seen a moment crouching low, as if she would wish to grovel upon the floor and bury her forehead in her hands. Yet sometimes across Mrs. Surratt's face a stealthiness creeps, a sort of furtive feline flashing of the eye, like that of one which means to leap sideways. At these times her face seems to grow hard and colorless, as if the tiger expression which Pradier caught upon the face of Brinvilliers and fastened into a mask had been repeated here. Not to grow mawkish while we must be kind, let us not forget that this woman is an old plotter. If she did not devise the assassination, she was privy to it long. She was an agent of contraband males, a bold, crafty, assured rebel, perhaps a spy, and in the event of her condemnation, let those who would plead for her spend half their pity upon that victim whose heart was like a woman's, and whose hand was merciful as a mother's. Before the door sits an officer, uncovered, who does not seem to labor under any particular fear, chiefly because the captives are ironed to immovability, and he stares and smiles alternately, as if he were somewhat amiable and extremely bored. Next to the officer is a shabby-looking boy, whose seat is by the right jamb of the jail door. Of all boys just old enough to feel their oats, this boy is the most commonplace. His parents would be likely to have no sanguine hopes for his reaching the presidency, for his head indicates latent dementia, and a slice or two from it would recommend him, without examination, to the school for the feeble-minded. Better dressed and washed and shaved, he might make a tolerable adornment to a hotel door, or even reach the dignity of a barkeeper, 
or an usher at a theater. But that this fellow should occupy a leaf in history, and be confounded with a tragedy entering into the literature of the world, reverses manifest destiny, and leaves neither phrenology nor physiognomy a place to stand upon. Come up, Gall, Spurzheim, and Lavater, and remark his sallow face, attenuated by base excesses. Do you know any forehead so broad, which means so little? The oyster could teach this man philosophy. His chin is sharp, his eyes are blank blue, his short black hair curls over his ears, and his beard is of a prickly black, with a moustache which does not help his general contemptibleness. A dirty grayish shirt without a linen collar is seen between the lapels of the greasy and dusty cloth coat, sloping at the shoulders, and under his worn brown trousers the manacle of iron makes an ugly garter to his carpet slipper. This is David Harold, who shared the wild night ride of Booth and barely escaped that outlaw's death in the burning barn. He stoops to the rail of the dock now and then to chat with his attorney, and a sort of blank anxiety which he wears as his head turns here and there shifts to a frolicking smile. But a woman of unusual attractions enters the court, and Harold is much more interested in her than in his acquittal. Great Caesar's dust, which stopped a knot-hole, has in this playboy an inverse parallel. He was at best ostler to a murderer, and failed in that. His chief concern at present is to have somebody to talk to, and he thinks upon the whole that if an assassination is productive of so little fun, he will have nothing to do with another one. That Harold had slipped into history gives us as much surprise as that he has yet to suffer death gives us almost contempt for the scaffold. But if the scaffold must wait for only wise men to get upon it, it must rot. Your wise man does no murder in the first place, and if so, in the second, he dodges the penalty. In this world, Harold, idiocy is oftener punished than guilt. That Booth should have used Herald is very naturally accounted for. Actors live only to be admired. Vanity rises to its climax in them. Booth preferred this sparrow to sing him paeans rather than live by an eagle and be screamed at now and then. On the right-hand side of Herald sits a soldier in blue who is evidently thinking about a game of quoits with his comrades in the jail yard. He wonders why lawyers are so very dry and is surprised to find a trial for murder as tedious as a thanksgiving sermon. But on the soldier's other hand is a figure which makes the center and cynosure of this thrilling scene. Taller by a whole head than either his companions or the sentries, Payne, the assassin, sits erect and flings his barbarian eye to and fro, radiating the tremendous energy of his colossal physique. He is the only man worthy to have murdered Mr. Seward. When against the delicate organization, the fine, subtle, nervous mind of the Secretary of State, this giant, knife in hand, precipitated himself, two forms of civilization met as distinctly as when the savage Gauls invaded the Roman Senate. Lawlessness and intelligence, the savage and the statesman, body and mind, fought together upon Mr. Seward's bed. The mystery attending Payne's home and parentage still exists to make him more incomprehensible. Out of the vague, dim Ultima Thule, like those Asiatic hordes which came from nowhere and shivered civilization, Payne suddenly appeared and fought his way to the sanctum sanctorum of law. I think his part in the assassination more remarkable than Booth's. The latter's crime was shrewdly plotted, as by one measuring intelligence with the whole government, but Payne did not think he only struck. With this man's face before me as I write, I am reminded of some Maori chief waging war from the lust of blood or the pride of local dominion. His complexion is bloodless, yet so healthy that a passing observer would afterwards speak of it as ruddy. His face is broad, with a character nose, sensual lips, and with very high cheekbones. The cranium is full, and the brow speaking, while the head runs back to an abnormal apex at the tip of the cerebellum. His straight, lusterless black hair, duly parted, 
is at the summit so disturbed that tufts of it rise up like red jackets or tecumsehs but the head is kept well up and rests upon a wonderfully broad throat muscular as one's thigh and without any trace as he sits of the protuberance called adam's apple withal the eye is the man pain's power it is dark and speechless and rolls here and there like that of a beast in a cage which strives in vain to understand the language of its captors it seems to say if anything that it has no sympathy with anybody approximate and has submitted like a lion bound to the logic of conviction and of chains Payne looks at none of his fellow prisoners assassins caught seldom care to recognize each other for while there is faithfulness among thieves there is none among murderers his great white eyeball never roves to anybody's in the dock nor theirs to his he has confessed his crime and they know it so they have no mutual hope they listen to the evidence because it concerns them he looks at it only because it cannot save him he is entirely beardless yet in his boyish chin more of a man physically than the rest combined while i watch this man i am constantly repeating to myself that stanza of bryant's upon the market-place he stood a man of giant frame amid the gathering multitude that shrank to hear his name all proud of step and firm of limb his dark eye on the ground and suddenly they gazed on him as on a lion bound his dress, which we scarcely notice in the grander contrast of his pose and stature, is an old shirt of woolen blue with a white nap at the buttonholes, and upon his knees of black cloth he twirls, as if for relaxation, between his powerful manacles, a soiled white handkerchief, if from his mother we conjecture a gift to a bloodhound from his dam. His heavy handcuffs make his broad shoulders more narrow yet we can see by the outline of the sleeves what girth the muscles has and the hand at the end of his long and bony arm is wide and huge as if he could wield a claymore as well as a dirk he also wears carpet slippers but his ankles are clogged with so heavy irons that two men must carry them when he enters or leaves the dock for this man there can be no sentiment no more than for a bull the flesh on his face is hard, as if cast rather than generated, and while we see how he towers above the entire court, we watch him in wonder, as if he were some maniac denizen of a zone where men without minds grow to the stature and power of fiends. The face of Payne is not of the traditional southern peculiarities. He resembles rather a Pennsylvania mountaineer than a Kentucky rustic. Three weeks ago I gave, in an account of the conspiracy which many gainsayed, but which the trial has fully confirmed, a sketch of this man, to which I still adhere. He was furnished to Booth and John Surratt from Canada, sent upon special service with his life in his hands, and he faced the murder he was to commit like any prize-fighter. I pity Beale, who died intelligently for a wretched essay against civilians, that his biography and fate must be matched by this savage's. Next to Payne, and crouching under him like a frog under a rock, is an inconsiderable soldier, who chews his cud and would cheerfully hang his protégé for the sake of being rid of him. My sympathies are entirely enlisted for this soldier. He has neither the joy of being acquitted nor the excitement of being tried. He is quite a sizable man by himself, but Payne overhangs him, and the dullness of the trial quite stultifies him. The few points of law which are admitted here are not so evident to this soldier as the point of his bayonet. I see what ails him. He wants to swear. A beam running overhead divides the court lengthwise in half, and as the prisoners sit at the end of the court, the German Atzerot, or Adzerota, has a place just beneath the beam. This is very ominous for Atzerot. The filthiness of this man denies him sympathy. He is a disgusting little groveller of dry, sandy hair, oval head, ears set so close to the chin that one would think his sense of hearing limited to his jaws, and a complexion so yellow that the uncropped brownness of his beard does not materially darken it. He wears a grayish coat, low, grimy shirt, 
and the usual carpet slippers of threadbare red over his shifting and shiftless feet. His head is bent forward, and seems to be anxiously trying to catch the tenor of the trial. Many persons outside of the court, Atzerat, are equally puzzled. From as much examination of this man as his insignificance permits, I should call him a gabby fellow, loud of resolution, ignoble of effort. Over his lager no man would be braver. His face is familiar to me from a review of those detective cabinets usually called rogues' galleries. As a sneak thief or bagman, I should convict him by his face. The same indictment would make me acquit him instantly of assassination. In this estimate I rely upon evidence as well as upon appearance. Atzerat swaggered about Kirkwood's hotel asking for the vice president's room. Payne or Booth would have done the murder silently. Nobody pities a dirty man. The same arts of dress and cleanliness which please ladies influence juries. Next to Atzerat sits a soldier, a very jolly and smooth-faced soldier, who at one time hears a witness say something laughable. The soldier immediately grins to the farthest point of his scalp, but he is chagrined to find that the joke is too trivial to admit of a laugh of duration. Very few jokes before the present court do so. But this soldier, being of long charity and excellent patience, awaits the next joke like a veteran under orders, and reposes his chin upon the dock, as if aware that between jokes there was ample time for a nap. The next prisoner to the right is O'Laughlin. He is a small man, about twenty-eight years of age, attired in a fine, soiled coat, but without white linen upon either his bosom or neck, and handcuffs rest hugely upon his mediocrity. His moustache, eyebrows, and hair are regular and very black. He does not look unlike Booth, though he seems to have little bodily power, and he is very anxious, as if more earnest than any of the rest, to have a fair lease upon life. 